be with me. You're welcome. And uh, start out with, uh, before you entered the Army, what did you do? Well, I just went to grade, sc uh, grade school and high school, and I worked in a grocery store on weekends. I had an uncle had a grocery store there. And, uh, of course, when I got up to get my driver's license back in there, I could do it at 16. I, I started delivering groceries in his truck. He delivered groceries to people, you know, and stuff. And I did that until I enlisted in the Army, and that was August 15, 1944, that I enlisted in the Army. They said you enlisted. You, you weren't drafted. I drafted, excuse me. Yeah. I, I was drafted. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. I was drafted. Okay. Yeah, I was, I'm sorry. I said it wrong. That's okay. I, I put enlist, but it was yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, I took my basic training down at uh, Camp Joseph T. Robinson in Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, that lasted up till December of '44. And they cut it a little bit short because the Battle of the Bulge was going on over there in Europe in November and December there. And uh, they cut us short, sent us home for a week furlough, and bounced us overseas. Uh, and uh, on January the 8th, 1945, the Queen Elizabeth pulled out of uh, Port, New York, and in six and a half days we landed in Scotland. I think it was Greenock, Scotland, I think was the name of it. And then from there we got on the land and, and uh, took a train to Weymouth, England. And then on, after that, well, we went across the, the Channel, English Channel, on the, to La Havre. And, and on January the 25th, 45, I actually joined the 12th Armored Division there. They were in Brooks-Wickersheim, France. And uh, they were pretty well beat up, but we had an awful lot of people coming in. And... Uh, and... Uh, they, they had hot showers with it because the guys hadn't had any showers, so we had to go over to Strasbourg and have hot showers. Well, then after that, uh, my first day in this combat was February the 4th. We actually took off for this little town called Komar, and uh, we met up with the enemy in this little town of uh, Komar, and we started moving in, and we had a tank, a tank making a path for us through the vineyard. In other words, he was going through there, chopping down the, the wires at the head of the thing up to made a path, and the infantry followed him in. They, they didn't have any heavy, heavy weapons that we knew about, so we were using that as protection anyway in case it started shooting with small, small fire. Well, I was one of the first group to go in, and we get up to this little town. It was a, a, a little town that had solid walls around it and just had a, an aisle or a path to come out once in a while. It's just like, a, like in a circle, you know, a little farming town. Well, as we were walking along there, after got up there close enough, here come a German around the corner out of one of those little alleyways, I'd call it. And he was ready to throw a, looked like a hand grenade, mash he used to call him. Of course, I fired from the hip, and I missed him, and he didn't get his, get his thing off, so he ducked back. <laughs> so nobody got hurt. But after about eight or ten of us, or maybe twelve, I can't remember, the, we got into to that wall, and that was for our protection. And then a burp gun from either upstairs or over to the side, let loose, and they killed 68 men right behind me. That was my first day in war, and I, I grew up in a hurry. <laughs> it really scared me. We had to have a tank come in to get us out of there later on that day. We had to have him come in, and then we got out in front of him, and then he slowly went. We, we marched ahead in front of him so they wouldn't get hit. So nobody got hurt but, except those guys that got shot during that raid in the morning. Well, right after that, the next day, we started moving along to some land over there. We were moving in some other places to make contact, you know. And uh, we had wet, cold feet because we had to walk in some creeks for a little while to, to get across these creeks and stuff. And you couldn't climb a bank. You had to get to a place where you'd get up. So I got wet feet and uh, a cold, boy, cold in February. And that night, on the 5th of uh, February, 45, I slept in a hay mile in a barn that we took one end of town. And there's supposed to have been June Ger Germans on the other end of town because you could hear the noise down there once in a while. So we had to put up guards and all that, and we did. But that night that we slept in that hay mile, a terrible thing happened to our group. There's two, two or three platoons there all together in that area, and we had guards out there. And during the night, somebody shouted out, Halt! Who goes there? And the guy didn't get the right answer. So the man that was on guard probably was excited and scared. He had a phosphorus grenade. That's one that explodes and burns into you. It just gets you in your skin. I mean, it just burns you. And he hit that man. I heard that blood-curdling scream. And boy, I couldn't go to sleep. I mean, it just bothered me so much. That was the first casualty I'd seen in World War II. 
But anyway, uh, he, he, the man died, of course. And then they hurried up and they went around and they got everybody up, rounded up, and said what happened. And now here's what you do and here's the password for tonight. And gave us all our instructions so that wouldn't happen again. Well, anyways, we started going to get the wet, cold feet. I ended up, uh, I guess, with frozen feet because uh, when I got back to the States, I used to get a little, like a blister or boil or something on my foot. And it would, it would drain and it would go away for a while. Well, there was a good uh, uh, skin doctor in their town there that we knew. And he says, the next time that happens, I happen to be working across just about a block away from his office. You come in right away. Don't burst it. And I'll take a, make a culture of it and see if we can't clean that up. Bless his heart, he did. His name was Maher, Dr. Maher. He gave me one shot and gave me a 30-day prescription. And the thing never did come back. So that was a fungus I had in there, but he killed it. And I've never had any trouble since. So then after that, why, uh, oh, on March the 24th, then, going on down here, it was F 45, I, do I donated a bazooka to the war. <laughs> we got down to some kind of a small water, body of water, river of some kind, and we were starting to capture some German soldiers wanting to give up in there, and they had a, a wire around these trees to, to get in that area. I mean, they had, you could tell it was a campsite or something. And... Uh, we had medics with us, and these two medics were uh, kind of souvenir crazed, I guess you'd call it. Every time they get in there and see a German, they're going to try and get one of his pistols or binoculars or something. And they both ran in ahead of the infantry, and both of them stepped on a landmine. And of course, they lost their feet and legs. That's another bird blood curling thing. It was terrible. So I had a bazooka, and I'd gotten in there so far, and I, a bazooka, I was assistant squad leader, and that's, that's a weapon to knock out tanks with, you know. And that was my job. I was assistant squad leader to carry it. Anyway, I sat against a tree and I talked to the Germans over as much as I, English, as much as the Germans I knew to make them come, come and see here, you know. And, and right out, straight ahead, you game first, you know. I, you, they made them understand. So they, they took me out there. Well, in the meantime, I'd laid that bazooka up against a tree. <laughs> I was watching where I was walking. They got us out of there. But I donated that bazooka. The, the platoon leader says, well, that's up to you. It's government property, something like that. And he says, I said, well, I'm going to donate it. That's a, that's a, they can have it because I'm not going back in there and get it unless you make me. He said, I'm not going to force you to go back in it. So I left it there. <laughs> anyway, uh, we went on down then on the 25th. We crossed the Rhine River at, uh, oh, I can't remember the name now. I got it in the book there. I guess it doesn't make much difference. And then on 1942, I went into shock. I mean, not 1942. April uh, 2nd? That doesn't look right. I guess maybe that was the 7th of April. Anyway, I went into shock because uh, in the Army, in our group, we have uh, what we call uh, uh, points. You go on the point, and that means one half track is leading in towards the combat people. And uh, We'd take turns. In the morning, one, one squad would take the lead, and the next afternoon do that, and the next day some other squad would go lead. Well, this particular day, we'd gone into a little place and going up a hill. There was an old barn up the top of the hill, and the road took made a turn. And the first tank says, hey, it's, it's 1 o'clock. I said, we've done it all day. I'll tell you what, we'll just take it all day. You can have it all day tomorrow, your turn. Okay, we agreed to that. Well, within a half hour, there was a... It's a howitzer 88, German 88 gun up there in that barn. And they hit that half track ahead of me. I was the second half track. Hit the gas tank and exploded. And there were several of the men, there was 12 men in there, or at least half of them, maybe seven or eight of them, came out burning because of that gasoline. Another thing, blood curling. And boy, I tell you, that scared me. I had nightmares about that thing a long time after I'd been home. Anyway, uh, we got blessed that day. I never got a scratch. But the guys ahead of us, that, that I think they killed six or seven of them, and then they had the rest of them were badly burned. They couldn't go back in service. So that was another terrible thing. And then uh, and I went into shock because this half-track driver, his name was Muir, Milton Muir, he patted me in the leg. He said, okay, Sergeant, you're okay. He said, I'm white as a ghost. I mean, that just shocked me. I just, I, I just didn't know what was going on. But he, he calmed me down, but that was terrible. And the next incident was on the 10th of April. We were going along a, an embankment. There was a big high hill, and up on the hill there was a 
there was a church up there, a little church. And uh, we were going along there, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, people, the half tracks ahead of us that were leading the were leading the, the spearhead that day, they stopped, and we were bunched up. We couldn't get around. All of a sudden, here comes a mortar shell lit on maybe 20 feet on one side of the half track. We were inside the half track. Well, it exploded because we were in the half track, and it didn't hurt us. Well, in less than a minute, here come another one on the other side of the half track. I said, John, I'm getting out of here. He was a squad leader. He said, oh, stay in here. You're better off in here. And just then, the uh, half tracks moved a little bit. And so we get out of there. And about 30 seconds later, right where we were sitting, pew, it went off. Once again, I was spared. Like I say, the Lord's got something for me to do in this world because he kept me free. Okay, after that, why, on the 11th, the night of the 11th of April, we went into another town. I can't remember the name right offhand. But uh, we took, we Germans were in the other end of the town, we ran them out. And, and we were in there deciding where we were going to build it and how we were going to set up our guard. All of a sudden, here come a tank down the street. Its lights were on and everything. And we'd come in there with no lights on, sneaking up. And he got up to our column and he jumped out and he says, Was is los? <laughs> and oh, before he said that, the, one of our platoon leaders said, Shut off those gosh darn lights. He says, You know, you're going to give us away. And the German guy came up, boss is low, so that means what's going on? Of course, they had their guns on him after he said that. Come on down. And he, he didn't know it. We took him by surprise. And there was two half-tracks right right square in front of that big tank gun. All he had to do was pull a pin or whatever it is. You know, he didn't do The guy was so scared he didn't want to get killed. He took, brought his rest of the crew out, and we captured that tank that night. <laughs> so that was another close one. Now, these are just things that happen. But I, they're so my, in my mind, I can't get them out of my mind. Okay, well, we got that tank. Then the next morning, when, when another thing happened bad, it was on the 12th of April, 45. I pulled guard duty that morning on my half track from 4 to 6 a.m. That was my turn. I know they had a two hour shift. They had 12 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6. Okay, I got off at 6. Well, at 6.45, the Germans counterattacked. And they hit that half track that I was on and uh, killed both, both, uh, both the guys on there and replaced me. And on that half track, there was a half track. There was a pair of binoculars that I'd taken off of a German soldier, and I had them mounted on the side of this half track inside there. Well, they got shrapnel in them, and uh, you can still see out of one side. I brought those home after World War II, and I donated them to the to museum down there in Abilene. Uh, well, I think in 2003, I took them down there, and I, and I gave them the incident about the two guys that got killed, what time of the morning it was, and how it happened, and uh, it, I put that on on record uh, so they'd have that down at the museum. Okay, then on the 14th of April, uh, the, that's where uh, my, my buddy got killed. We were, we were in a town on the 14th, and there was a building there, and we came up on this building, and we split up the squad. Six went one side, and six went the other. My buddy, he was my, we have what they, you know, they got the buddy system in the service. So I said, Phil, you take that side and I'll take this side. So he went around there. He no more got around there and a mortar shell hit. It killed him instantly and wounded three other fellas. And I never I never got a never got a scrap again. I mean it's just amazing how many things I just like I had a light on me or gold uh, Holy Spirit with me, an angel. <laughs> but they really took care of me. Well, before that, one fella got wounded that day. We were taking turns giving each other a haircut. You know, you get over there when you need a haircut. So he gave me a haircut, and he said, now you cut mine. Well, I, I, I was terrible at it. I was only 18. I didn't know anything about barbering. I just took a hair of all those little hand clippers. He was one of the guys who got wounded. And when he came back about six weeks, he said, you'll never give me another haircut. He said, boy, I was rather more about that and all. I did a terrible job on the guy. He said, I was really embarrassed. <laughs> so anyway, okay, then on the 17th of April, uh, we went into Ansbach. And... Uh, I was going up over a little rise. I was carrying a bazooka at that time yet. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, here comes the dust flying around my feet. Well, it was snipers trying to get a hold of the uh, guy carrying that bazooka, see. And uh, I ducked back down over the hill, and I went in some bribery bushes, and that's the only blood I ever drew during World War II. I got a few little thorns in me. <laughs> so that happened. 
And in Ansbach, we finally got into that town. I, I liberated a beautiful knife. It says Hauptmann Dreher, D-R-E-H-E-I. That was a German name. That's Hauptmann's captain. I still have it. It's beautiful. It's made of Swedish steel. Boy, it's got a, almost like a pinpoint edge on the back. I mean, that's something that could really run through a person. I got that. I, I got some of my kid, grandkids want one of that. I don't know who I'm going to give it to yet, but I got it. <laughs> but I got it put away. And then uh, later on, on the 4th of May, we liberated about 20-some American uh, prisoners. We came into a, to a place down in southern Germany there. I don't remember what it was, but they were in a compound. And the, the guard, he took off running. And I, I took bead, and the guy said, don't, don't, don't shoot him. And so the guy, he stopped then. I wasn't going to shoot him. He came back downstairs, his hands up. They said he took good care of us. He fed us water and took care of us, so we didn't want to hurt him. So I didn't have to shoot him, thank goodness. That happened. And then... We got down near the end of the war, and we ended up in near Fischbach, Austria. We were on the Austrian border. We had to drink the water out of the drainage of the mountains. It's the only water we had. We had to put extra halazone tablets in to get because the SSers were up there in the mine. We didn't know what they were putting in there, so we we drank the water. Nobody got sick, but that was it. And then we had to when we got down there the next morning after we got that water thing. German general came in, and uh, no, no, excuse me. We went into a house. And we got a German general because we were in this house and uh, we had the guys going around looking in the closets and he found a, a, a uniform that fit this guy who looked like a civilian. They got up there and they found a picture and made him put it on. So then he called the, the uh, MPs to come over and, and take him back as a prisoner. So, so we got a German general that day. And then later on that day, we had a railroad car. I didn't know, but here come another man in, officer from the German army. He wanted to surrender. He had a flag with him. So my squad leader, John, said, Bill, you take a few guys you order and bring, bring them in. So we went over there, and they had, they had rifles and all that stuff, but they had had them laying on the ground, you know. So I had the guys go over and bend them all up. I mean, just break the shocks off and everything, because we didn't have a way of carrying all of them. And we, and we marched the prisoners back into town, or maybe half a mile or so, I don't know. We smashed the weapons anyway. And that was the last day, that was the 4th of May. Then we got relieved the next day, and they pulled us back, and we went back to, I think, Augsburg, Germany till the end of the war, and then, uh, well, that's the end of my story there, except later on that year, I re-enlisted because I could go home on a furlough. I didn't have enough points to, to get out of service. So on the uh, 8th of, uh, I mean, excuse me, I got another two. I re-enlisted uh, November the 9th, 45. I was a regular army through the 8th that day, and, it's, and when I re-entered, took the sword to, to be enlisted again. I went in and re-enlisted November the 9th in Germany. And then I came back to the U.S. I left there over Europe, 11, 29, 45, landed 12, 15, 45, got home. I had a 60-day furlough on the 1st of March. I was all that time I was home. 1st of March, I went back to France, landed on the 10th of March. And, I, and then I stayed there until October 6th to 45, and, uh, or 46, I mean, and in the... You, and I landed in the U.S. 10, 15, 46, and I had to spend the rest of my time till, till 9th of November, Fort Meade, Maryland, before I got discharged. So that's my military service. After I got home, I went to Bradley University and got a bachelor's degree and worked at Caterpillar Drafting Company for 30 years and retired and, and enjoyed a good retirement. I've been out there 26 years. Okay, now, uh, something that I had asked you about uh, previously and we talked about yesterday, uh, a little bit about coming over across the ocean on the Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. which again you said at the time was the largest passenger ship around. Uh, tell me a little bit about the living accommodations. Well, it was crowded. <laughs> In my mind, it looks like we had about 15,000 troops. I mean, I, I heard that. Somebody said 15,000. I always said, I wonder how many we got on here. Now that starts my, stays in my mind, but it might not be true. But if they could check that voyage of the Queen Elizabeth that day, they could tell you, I guess, someplace the Warty Bar, somebody could tell you how many were on there. But it was crowded. I mean, we had these little cabins, we're going to call them. They had bunks, four, four stack four high, and each guy had to kind of crawl in, you know. The first guy had to climb up on the edge of the other one to get up there, and whoever, least rank or something, I don't know how we worked it out, <laughs> had, to, had to get on there and, and, and sleep. And it was pretty close quarters. But the Queen Elizabeth was very smooth going over. It only took us six and a half days to get over there. And we, we landed in Scotland, Greenwich, Scotland. And then we went in over to uh, Weymouth, England, and on, on over to Lafarge, France, and then 
Well, like I said, I joined with the 12th Armored Division on uh, January 25th, 1945. But it was a, it was a big ship, and they, they, they uh, changed course every three minutes to, to, to uh, keep the submarines from getting a beat on them. So that's what they said. Well, sir, I want to thank you for sitting down and agreeing to tell, tell me your story. Mm -hmm. We've got it on tape now, so uh, it'll be there for future generations of historians. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you for you, doing it. I appreciate it.